Local programming on KRWG Public Media made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Fronteras at Changing America. I'm Anthony Morneau, your host. Today we continue our conversation about immigration and human rights along the border. With us is founder and executive director of the Border Network for Human Rights. Please welcome Fernando Garcia. Mr. Garcia, thank you again for continuing this conversation well, with us. Thank you for having me. Now, so much focus has been on the border uh, with the rise in asylum seekers to the border as well as the treatment that they've they've been um, undergoing as well so i'd like to hear your thoughts as your organization brings leaders from washington to the border and what are some of your plans as far as bringing the border to washington yeah first uh let me say what um what we've been telling to all of these people that is coming i mean they are coming for a reason they are they they they, they listen about what is happening at the border but sometimes when they are so far away from the border, the more chaotic it looks like. So when they come, they are trying to understand the reality. So I think the Americans are concerned about what is happening at the US-Mexico border, and they should be, because what is happening at the border, we had not seen for many, many years, especially we're saying previously that too many evil things happening at the same time. Um, and just to enumerate some of them, I mean, we have uh, separation of families, we had uh, re re rejection of asylum seekers, families, mothers and children and fathers in detention. We had m migrant children dying in detention centers, the building of walls, drone systems in the sky. We have massive enforcement, not only the Border Patrol in big numbers, but also the National Guard. And, and the latest is the active duty soldiers. And on top of that, we recently have the militias that came to the border. So all of that is happening in less than two years. And I think uh, people is, is concerned, and, and we are concerned, obviously. We're, we're, we're reacting to everything that happened. So one of the way that we are trying to connect with other communities to, is to organize uh, these delegations from the interior. And we had had like a multiple delegations from from, from concerned citizens to faith-based lead, leaders, to civil rights leaders, and they come and they see and they are uh, very worried and very concerned about what the border, but also what America it is becoming, because uh, it is important to say that this is the, the, what is happening today at the border. It is not about the refugees or about immigrant families per se. It is about what we are as a country. And I think that is what, what is the main discussion today is what, is what is the United States will be in 50 years? Is it gonna be a country that persecute children and, and immigrants and build walls or, or we're gonna come to the realization and to the acceptance that immigrants are part of our history and then immigrants are, are gonna be part of our future. I think that is the, the essence of what, what is happening right now at the border. Do you think there's too much fear along this conversation or debate about how our immigration policy should be shaped and how we should uh, deal with a, a policy for people seeking asylum? You know, fear has been the fundamental base of this uh, narrative being promoted by the President of the United States. So, so that's the kind of the first elemental piece of fear. I mean, people in the interior, is been, uh, they've been listening to the President uh, saying that you should be afraid. You should be afraid of those immigrants because they are, uh, they, they are criminals, they are rapists, and we should not accept them in the country. I mean, that's the kind of fear that he's playing with. But also there's a other level of fear is the fear of our border communities and people is afraid uh, we have stories of u.s citizens here in southern new mexico now and in el paso children that ru that run away from border patrol they are u.s citizens what kind of fear should they have you talk about run this 
this, from Border Patrol. This fear in Im immigrant communities. Now, I, I know you've been documented it. Your, your organization has been working to uh, document many of these concerns that border yeah. communities have. What are some of the things that you're hearing from border communities yeah. with, with things happening right now? Well, um, we need to start with these this enforcement actions. We had received multiple incidents and complaints about uh, immigration authorities going into properties without search warrant, going into your backyard and sometimes into your home with no legal orders. So I think people is very afraid of that situation. Or for example, the other one is that uh, the second level of, of, of patterns that we had found is that people is afraid of being stopped because the way they did look. I mean, if you look like Mexican, whatever that means, it's more likely that you're gonna be stopped and be questioned by Border Patrol agents or ICE agents. Uh, and also the ultimate fear is that whatever action enforcement does is gonna separate you from your children, from your, from, from your family members. I think that, that it has had permeated deeply into our communities today. What do you think is going to really solve some of these problems? Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems like in the last two years, there's been so much controversy, there's been so much confusion with family separation, with the implementation of Remain in Mexico policy. Now we're seeing even uh, more policies where people have to stay in their own country, mm -hmm. um, dealing with specifically uh, Central American countries. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, you have the talk of strengthening border security funding for that. Some people, lawmakers, have alleged that that is without accountability. There are so many things happening all at once, so how do we as a country, how do our elected officials yeah. start to address this issue? So I think there are, there are different things that I believe sh it should happen, and some of them we're doing already. Uh, the, f the first thing is that we need to really continue the education um, of our border community and border residents, especially to tell them that the Constitution is still valid at the U.S.-Mexico border. That in Las Cruces, in El Paso, the First Amendment, the, the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment rights of the Constitution are guaranteed. And, and, and I say that because there's been this narrative that immigrants or residents, because we live at the border, we don't have those rights. And I think that is, that, that is false, that is a lie. So I think the first thing is to actually get every family to learn what the rights are. And I think we should focus a lot of our energy there because I do believe that border residents and immigrant families have become the first defenders and they need to become the first defenders of the U.S. Constitution. I think what, that is one level of a, of a solution. So if you know your rights, so it's, it's less likely that you're gonna be abused by these, these agencies. Secondly, uh, we need to change the practice and the policies that are allowing these abuses to happen. And at the border, we have the largest enforcement operation, the largest immigration enforcement, with a lot of money, with a lot of personnel, with, without a single independent oversight and accountability mechanism. We don't know if the operations are working. We don't know if the money is being, is being used the way they're supposed to. We don't know what is the, the civil rights and human rights in, impacts of these Operation. So we need to have legislation to bring accountability and oversight to these institutions at the border, and we're working on it. I mean, Con Congresswoman Escobar from El Paso introduced Bill HR 2203, which creates mechanisms for oversight, mechanisms for accountability, mandate human rights trainings. Uh, so it, it's very comprehensive. So I think we need to have that. We need, we need Congress to act on these issues. Another level of bringing Washington to the border, it is that we are demanding that Congress have full field hearings here at the border. They need to come to El Paso and to Las Cruces. Then the committees, the, the Homeland Security Committee, the, the, the Judiciary Committee, they need to bring members of Congress to listen to the different concerns of our constituencies. You know, but they have not done it. We have delegations coming from Washington of yeah. members of Congress, but we don't have full formal hearings from Congress. So I think that is important. And finally, I, I do believe that we need, to, we need to fight back and change this racist 
uh, agenda that has permeated Washington and the rest of the country. I think 2020 is going to be an, a, a, an important moment in history to define wha what we are going to be for the next 50 years. You, you, met, you bring that up as, um, you know, a, a certain agenda. You call it, in your words, racist. What are some things about this policy, you know, that you've seen that you feel leads you to make that, um, that opinion? Um, let me elaborate. Uh, when I asked previously about how many terrorists had been detained at the, at the U.S.-Mexico border, the answer was zero. How many incidents of potential terrorism or, 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 or terrorism had happened in the Canadian U.S. border? We had multiple of them. We have the 9-11 hijackers. Some of them came through the Canadian border. Then we have the LA bomber. A few years ago, an individual crossed the border with, between the United States and Canada with a, 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 a truck loaded with explosives and with the idea of taking that truck to the LA airport and explode the truck. There. So if we needed to build the wall, if we needed to militarize any border, we don't want it, but if we needed to, under that argument of, of national security, it should have been the, the, the Canadian and the, in the U.S. border. But we had not done that. All of the massive militarization had happened in this U.S.-Mexico border, and that's why we asked why. I mean, if we had not had a threat like that at the U.S.-Mexico border, then who is the enemy? What, what is these people are afraid of? So uh, you come to the realization that the enemy is like those poor immigrants of color that are coming from Mexico and Central America. That they had become the enemy in, in this equation. So there is no way to understand this, but, but to understand it has a racist, xenophobic agenda. Well, I think that it should also be in the conversation that there are major concerns about drug trafficking into the United States and human trafficking as well. With that, do you, how do you feel that this immigration enforcement policy by the Trump administration has done to those organizations? Do you Not, think it has empowered them even more than some may have been concerned? Or do you have any concerns uh, in regards to that? Let me tell you, the war on drugs is a losing battle for this administration and for others because drugs continue to come in the vast majority of drugs, they don't come between ports of entry. They come, as we say, legally in trucks and in, in airplanes and boats. So that, it, this is not about drugs. It, it is not. There are, of all of the trucks that actually come across a one port of entry, they can just check like 10 of them out of 100 because they don't have the manpower, the technology. So if there was a war on drugs, you should have put more people and more emphasis in ports of entry in this administration is not doing it. But let me tell you this, with this idea that now you're gonna militarize the border and you're gonna be very tough of Im on immigrants, who is gaining in this? Are the cartels and the smugglers and the human traffickers? Because in the past, people would just cross by themselves the border or, or just rely on family members. It wasn't the big business that now it is. Now, who has the capacity to bring people across the border in this militarized zone? Well, the people that has infrastructure, and those are criminal organizations in Mexico. So ironically, toughening and building up the border, uh, it, is, it is making these organizations uh, more profitable in Mexico than before, because they are the only ones that they can take people across, we just had the, the story of the other day of these Marines in, in San Diego that they were paid off, they were corrupted with a lot of money to actually bring people across. So I think the way that enforcement is happening is not helping, it's not, it's, it's not defeating crime, but also it's creating more problems for Im immigrants at the end of the day. I'd like to talk a little bit more about uh, asylum seekers who are being forced to wait in what is, what, until their number is called. 
um, to go before uh, immigration yeah. officials. Um, what are your concerns with this policy in making people wait in yeah. Mexico? You know, the, the migration protection protocol and the remaining Mexico policy, uh, those two are violating international law and the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. And let me tell you why, because when somebody applies to asylum in the United States, that person immediately is under the jurisdiction of the United States. And what the 14th Amendment says is that you cannot take the liberty, the property of the life of that people with a due process of law. And what this administration has done is accepting the application and send them back to Mexico, waiting for the court case. So what is what they found in Mexico? I mean, what these refugees uh, are experiencing in Juarez. The first thing is that they don't have any kind of legal support in Juarez. They don't have family networks or community networks to support. They don't have jobs. They don't have food. They don't have water. And they are in the midst of violence. Juarez is a violent city. Up, up to today, 11 refugees and immigrants have died due to the violence in Juarez and other parts of the border. So re in reality, you are sending these families to a very dangerous situations. In Mexico, it is part of the problem. The government of Mexico, by accepting that situation, because the United States pressured Mexico to accept the remaining Mexico. So I think uh, what had happened is that the Mexican government in Mexico has become the backyard of the immigration policies. In Mexico is doing the dirty job of immigration uh, of the United States. I came back from um, re recently for, from a trip to, to, to the Guatemala-Mexico border. And I never seen a border, a Mexican border, so militarized as we are seeing it today. National guards, armies, the, the army and, our, and soldiers are being used to stop immigrants in southern Mexico. And even in Juarez, we had seen the deployment of soldiers on the Mexican side of the border to not to let immigrants to come across. All of that under the pressure of the administration, or Trump's administration. So I know that you know you want to have more policymakers in on the border so that they know what's happening so they can see with their own eyes what's happening committee hearings you mentioned mm -hmm. things like that how can the border go to DC you know uh, we are in the works we're working with uh, multiple networks and allies to to take the border to this, literally. I mean, we want to take uh, dozens and of hundreds of families and border residents to DC to showcase their testimonies, but also for, for DC to, to understand that, that what they are doing at the border would be unacceptable elsewhere. Uh, you know, militarizing the US, Mex the, sorry, militarizing El Paso and Las Cruces and, and the, the, the US side of the border is violating the Posse Comitatus Act, a, a very old law that prohibits the deployment of, the, of, of soldiers within American soil. I wonder if we accept that as a country, then that would happen in Los Angeles, in Washington, D.C., in Chicago. So it is unacceptable that to have children in cages. What would happen if those seven children that died in detention would be white American children? I think their reaction would be different because they were Central Americans and refugees as well. They don't count, they don't matter. So, so I think we need to take families and border residents to the border and tell them that our border communities matter and, and immigrants matter at the end of the day. So what we've been saying, and this is true, this border has become the New Orleans Island. This border has become where the nation, the future of the nation is gonna be defined. You call, you just mentioned that you think the border is the new Ellis Island. Why do you feel that way? I feel very strongly about it because when you think about Ellis Island and the Statue of Liberty, you think about the ideal of America. At the end of the day, we are, this is a nation of immigrants, the melting pot, all of the different things that we know. And I believe that at that time, that border, 
the, the Ellis, the Ellis Island was a border, the, the border with Europe at that time, defined the character of the nation. And I do believe that this border, what is happening today and what is going to happen in a few months, is going to define the character of America for the next 50 years. It's, it's either we're going to be a nation of walls, detention centers, concentration camps, having immigrants detained and children in cages, or we're going to be much, something better than that. We're going to be a nation that accepts that our destiny is tied to immigrants and immigration. That these immigrants that are coming today, the ones that are in Juarez right now as asking for asylum, they have the same hopes and aspirations that the one that came to Ellis Island 100 years ago. They have the same motives and reasons why they left their country, violence, extreme poverty. That's the same thing that happened with those Europeans. So I think what, what is being tested at the border, it is the character of America. And we're going to resolve it one way or the other. How do you get people to understand that vision of what you just said about defining our character uh, as a country? You know, you mentioned Ellis Island, but how do you get people whose ancestors are from European countries to really understand what's happening when perhaps they've maybe had little interaction with people from <laughs> Mexico, people from Central America, you know, people yeah. of color. Yeah, well, I would, I would challenge that idea that they had little interaction because it, it is, I mean, right now we have millions and millions of um, immigrants of color that, uh, especially Hispanic and, and, and others, other immigrants, that are sustaining big ch chunks of our economy. I mean, if you talk about the construction ex sector, the, the hospital and healthcare, I mean, it is immigrants, the ones picking up tomatoes in, in Chile, in southern New Mexico. They, they are the ones that are in Iowa, are in the meat packing plants. I mean, immigrants, especially recent immigrants, they sustain a very good portion of our economy. So there is one movie uh, that, it's a very bad movie, but uh, in the past, probably a few years ago, um, probably you saw it, that it was called A Day Without yeah. Immigrants. Yeah. What would happen if all of those immigrants would disappear in one moment? It would be a disaster for, for America. And I know there's- For the rest of the country. There's been a lot of reporting on, on that, um, on the impact of immigrants, and especially immigrants in, in rural America and, um, you know, of course, major cities. Um, I'd like to talk with you about this issue in general, though, immigration reform. Mm -hmm. We've seen many efforts over the mm -hmm. years to take this on, take this issue on, but they've failed. Perhaps they've passed through one body of uh, Congress, but not through both. Um, what are your concerns about this? Um, and do you think this is even obtainable? Not the way that it is happening right now. Immigration reform is not, be, is, is not being, hasn't been good for our border communities because we don't get any kind of immigration reform, but we get more militarization out of the result of immigration reform. The way that I see is two, is, 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 is two parallel tracks to move forward. One of them is enforcement reform. What that means is we need to make Border Patrol, ICE, and other agencies accountable to the U.S. Constitution and to human rights. I mean, that is very important that independently of immigration reform, you wouldn't, we shouldn't have mistreat people like we are at those detention centers. We, we shouldn't have Border Patrol agents insulting and beating up people. I mean, we need to have enforcement reform. But on the other hand, immigration reform is going to take a lift. I mean, I recognize that it's going to be difficult, but we have to. At the end of the day, we have 11 plus million people already in the United States. We need to fix that immediately. They, they are part of the, our, our system, our economy, our society. They need to be legalized and be a pathway to citizenship. But secondly, it's very important. We need to delink immigration from other criminal activities at the border. We need to actually allow immigrants that are coming to work or to look for protection, to apply to the systems that we had established and, and, and then put them in a different pathway. So we need to legalize the flows of immigrants. And I think because we're going to need them. Uh, in, and I think that is going to be part of the immigration reform discussions in the next, I, I believe in the next four years, we're going to have some kind of solution. I strongly believe that we're going to get there. Now, 
some people may be concerned that with such a large part of the immigration debate right now dedicated to asylum seekers and border enforcement and how it's happening right now in policy that there is a group of people who put their faith in the federal government with the DACA program, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program. Now, many of these folks uh, in this program that got in may be concerned about what's happening right now. Do you have any concerns about uh, folks in DACA or who had applied to DACA or, or perhaps maybe having their, uh, their expiration of that program happening with them right now? Uh, do you think they're getting lost in the conversation right now? Yeah, we have the understanding that uh, the, the DACA, the, the information provided by DACA recipients will not be used for immigration enforcement. I, I, let me say that. But with this administration, we cannot trust that at this point. I mean, DACA recipients, dreamers, uh, are, are, are already here. I mean, they are, they are either studying in the, in the universities, here in New Mexico, in Texas, but also they are, they are working, making a life and actually contributing to the United States already. And they are in the limbo. And this president, President Trump, wants to get rid of DACA. I mean, that is, that is the reality, that is true. So what we need is to have Congress to act. And I think that's, I think our hope right now, this year and next year, it is to have Congress to act on, on some of these issues and force the presidency to protect DACA recipients, but also expand the pool of DACA and Dreamers because there are many Dreamers that are not part of the DACA program. DACA program is very limited and we have other Dreamers that should be part of a larger program in whatever capacity, in whatever immigration reform we have in the future. Okay, I want to thank you so much for joining us. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Uh, Fernand Fernando Garcia, founder and executive director of the Border Network for Human Rights. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And we want to thank you for joining us on Fronteras at Changing America. I'm Anthony Moreno.